we pray for those marked with the sign of the cross who have fallen in battle. We ask God for mercy on all those who have died as a result of war. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reflection for Remembrance Sunday from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. Now, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. And this is the will of my Father that sent me, that every one who seeth the Son and believeth in him may have life everlasting, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jami used the term Padre in the Peninsular War at the beginning of the 1800s, although some would claim that it goes further back and it was first used in India. It's always important in the army to address someone by the correct title. Padre proved to be a very useful way of avoiding distinguishing between Catholic and Anglican chaplains in the First World War. You could lump them all together without offence by using a foreign word. In fact, the ritualism controversy in the Church of England meant that it was just as useful between different types of Anglican churchmanship. Some would be offended to be called father, and others would insist on it. What's in a name? The first two-minute silence held in London on the 11th of November 1919 was reported in the Manchester Guardian the following day. The first stroke of 11 produced a magical effect. The tram cars glided into stillness. Motors ceased to cough and fume and stopped dead. And the mighty limbed dray horses hunched back upon their loads and stopped also seeming to do it of their own volition. Someone took off his hat, and with a nervous hesitancy, the rest of the men bowed their heads also. Here and there, an old soldier could be detected slipping unconsciously into the posture of attention. An elderly woman, not far away, wiped her eyes and the man beside her looked white and stern. Everyone stood very still. The hush deepened. It had spread over the whole city and become so pronounced as to impress one with a sense of audibility. It was a silence which was almost pain and the spirit of memory brooded over it all. Armistice Day became Remembrance Day in the Second World War. I wonder, what were all those people thinking in the hush, in the stillness, not just in 1919? but every year since, right up to today. 
Were they thinking about the good things of life that the fallen have been deprived of? What might have been for them, for us, for the country, for society? Do they hear the voices of those leaders, the demagoguery, the slogans, what we would call today the hate speech, the defiance? Maybe the sounds from closer to the front, the barked orders, the troops, Trumping, marching, the crump of guns. Maybe they spend the two minutes pondering the horror of the experiences of loved ones at the front. Perhaps written in little letters, crumpled, last messages. What about the different ways in which death might have come? For others, they want something a bit more positive. Perhaps just a country scene at this moment. Feel, ah yes, covered in poppies perhaps. A grey stone, ten, a hundred, thousand, stretching as far as the eye can see in regular lines. All plain headstones. Oh, so much scope for the imagination. It is a good thing to do lest we forget. The spirit of memory broods over it all. It's different today a little bit. What we have seen through modern media in recent days is undoubtedly more graphic, more instant. It may even be live. Still, I suspect that it doesn't enter as deeply into our minds, our hearts, unless we were there, of course. We are overwhelmed by the sheer volume, by the speed of it all. Does it leave much to the imagination? The imagination that enters into our minds and hearts that forms memories do modern media lend themselves to remembrance at all two-thirds of all young people apparently seems an impossible figure to come to, but nevertheless, two thirds of all young people don't know what Remembrance Sunday is about. Some people seem to have forgotten already what Hamas did to provoke the Israeli response in Gaza. Like Padre, Remembrance is a convenient word which in the past helped gloss over differences. It's particularly true between the Catholic faith and the Protestant denominations. Do this in remembrance of me. In the center of the mass and there in the Eucharist. This can be said by all who claim the name of Christian but it means something very different to different people. 
Do we just look back at events 2,000 years ago at a once and for all during Mass, during the Eucharist, during whatever service other Christians might attend? Do we sit in the pew and try to picture Golgotha? So much scope for the imagination. A good thing to do. The spirit of memory broods over it all. As Catholics, do we know that this once and for all sacrifice is being represented before our eyes? Time and space dissolve. We are entering into the passion of our Lord in reality. In the tabernacle and on the altar, he is truly present. I went to see a small exhibition this week. The Liszt Institute is part of the Hungarian Embassy. It's near Trafalgar Square. It's called Cross in Fire. The charity involved is Hungary Helps. It's about persecution of Christians in the Middle East and Africa in recent days. Hungary is one of the few countries in Europe prepared to defend Christianity by name, to speak out about the atrocities perpetrated against us around the world. I was struck by some images from a town near Damascus in Syria, which was overrun by jihadists in 2013. The people there still speak Arama Aramaic, the native language of Jesus. It has a proud Christian heritage from the 4th century AD. There were many atrocities in 2013. Amongst them, icons were desecrated, often by blotting out the eyes and the face of the figures, sometimes doing it with bullets. Islam, of course, prohibits the depiction of human features. God is too ineffable to be depicted. We Christians understand that. God the Father is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. But he sent his son born of the Virgin Mary, fully man and fully God. God has a face. I want to suggest that way back in 1919, as today, for many involved in the conflict, God was and is faceless. In 1919, there was a lot of, well, church going, which was actually hollowed out. They may not have known the God they worshiped. They may have had some theoretical grounding, but that was it. And even amongst those who were regular churchgoers, such as the Prime Minister before the war, Arthur Balfour, you find that when it comes to it, they weren't ready to look at the face of God on the cross. For sure, the ever-present threat of death 
and brought some back to church, but it didn't last. The war faded and so did their practice, so did their memory. And it was worse after the Second World War. Since then, we've not been very good at passing on even just that memory to our children, have you, have we? There's a denial of God himself in our institutions, including especially perhaps education. There's relentless atheistic materialism. There's false toleration and inclusion, which are poor substitutes for genuine principles. And so when a challenge comes, such as that we witnessed this past weekend, then we aren't ready. And those who are ready to stand up, to stand still for God in society, find themselves outnumbered. The face of God has been mutilated, disfigured in so many ways since 1919. In scenes yesterday in central London are but a, a symptom read. Is God punishing us? And sometimes asked. In justice, he ought. For our own good, he may wish to remind us that life is short and eternity is long. But in mercy, he gives us yet more time to repent. On the cross, the face of God is disfigured by our sins and by evil. But it is not blotted out. His enemies on all sides want a void. They deny the person. Ask yourself, do you? Do you, by your action, by your inaction, by a faith which is perhaps faded, by memories, do I not understand deep down what it is that I am remembering. And we turn to the cross above the altar and we tell our Saviour hanging there for our sins that we love him. That indeed, we love him all the more when he carries the marks of the world's hatred in his body. Let's tell him so frequently. Let's not make it just once a year. Let's make reparation. Let's do penance. Remember the promise. This is the will of my Father that sent, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth in him may have life everlasting. And I will raise him up at the last day. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever.